There's no need to get tense. Relax with Flux Condenser. Subscribe, baby, subscribe. Welcome, I'm Flux Condenser. For a couple of years now, I've been collecting and repairing antique radios. I'm no scientific expert, but through lots of research and hands-on experience, I've successfully restored lots of vintage electronics, like this Bendix console. A lot of what I've learned is from watching YouTube channels such as these, all of which I highly recommend. The target audience for this series is a bit different than those other channels, though. I'm going to be thorough and not dumb things down, but I'm not going to assume you already have a lot of experience. My only assumption is that you're interested in vintage radios and are curious about how they work. This series focuses on one radio, and I'll take you through each phase of the cabinet and electronics restoration. You'll learn about every circuit and some other interesting things along the way. Some videos will cover just one subject, while others, like this one, will cover two, three, or more. I'm posting the first videos in February of 2019, and the rest will steadily follow. So, if you're interested in following along, please subscribe to my channel and click the bell to get timely updates. Let's move on to Section 2. I buy a lot of my antique radios on eBay. Because they're fragile, most sellers take care when packing them for shipment. A good seller will stabilize the tubes with foam and double box with lots of padding. For especially heavy or valuable radios, it's best to remove the chassis from the cabinet and pack it separately. Too often, I'll receive a radio that had its chassis dislodged during shipping. This causes all sorts of damage. Usually, I can fix a radio with shipping damage as, believe it or not, reproduction dials and other parts are often available online. But last February, I received a radio that was so damaged in shipping that I considered it beyond repair. A shame, because as you can see from the seller's photo, it was a beautiful radio, filthy and in need of restoration, but still a diamond in the rough. Unfortunately, the cabinet was completely destroyed, so I negotiated with the seller to return most of my money. I figured I'd just throw the cabinet pieces away and use the chassis for parts. But then my 13-year-old said, Dad, just glue it back together. At first, I laughed at the suggestion, but then I started thinking, Hmm, you know, maybe I could. This is the story of my endeavor to reverse time and unsmash this radio and get it working again. Did I restore its 1930s movie star good looks? Or did I end up with a franken mess? Stay tuned. Before we get into the restoration, let's learn a little about our little radio. And yes, it is small. The Emerson Model 108 measures 7 inches wide by 10 inches high. It was introduced in 1936, the year Nazi Germany established the Sachsenhausen concentration camp. Gone with the Wind, the book, was published, and Charlie Chaplin released the film Modern Times. And indeed, the modern times of the mid-30s brought technologies that helped bring radio to the height of its popularity. One was the use of resins. Similar to today's plastics, Resins allowed radios to be made more inexpensively and with more intricate designs than with wood. Popular resins were Bakelite, Catalan, and Plaskin. Bakelite radios are often brown or painted other colors. Catalan has a beautiful, marble-like appearance and can be made in many colors. And Plaskin radios are usually a creamy white. Our radio is made of Plaskin and typical for that type has an ivory-like appearance. Modern plastics aren't as aesthetically pleasing as these old resins, but they're far stronger, so we don't see much of Plaskin, Bakelite, or Catalan anymore. Our radio also features an All-American 5 Super Heterodyne Circuit. All-American 5 radios don't need a big, expensive transformer, so they had the advantage of being smaller and less expensive. Additionally, the Super Heterodyne circuit significantly improved performance while also making radios much easier to use. What did all these modern features cost? 
according to the SAD, $24.95. Cheap, right? Not really. In today's dollars, that's $450. All American 5 radios were less expensive, but they certainly weren't cheap. Kintsugi, or golden joinery, is the Japanese tradition of calling attention to the repair of a broken object. Instead of considering damage a mistake to be concealed, it's considered a part of an object's history to be shown to the world. It reminds me of the lyrics from one of my favorite songs. You should wear with pride the scars on your skin. They're a map of the adventures and places you've been. As I washed and glued the broken pieces of our radio, I thought Kintsugi would be the perfect way to bring it back to life. After all, the damage was so severe, I may as well have fun and call attention to it. But then I remembered, this is an all-American 5 radio, and in America we don't celebrate our mistakes, we fix them, or cover them up. Fixing our radio's damage was going to be difficult. Many of the pieces had shattered beyond recognition, and entire portions of the radio's intricate design needed to be rebuilt. But how? After a bit of googling, I came across a product called Epoxy Sculpt. It's an epoxy-like resin that I could mold like clay, and that would harden into a material similar to Plaskin, only much stronger. Artists and model makers use epoxy sculpt to create all sorts of incredible stuff. I'm no sculptor, but I ordered a batch, mixed it up, and set out to see if I could use it to help rebuild our radio. After gluing what was left of the pieces together, I started by repairing the cabinet's decorative rails. As you can see in this photo of the cabinet before it was wrecked, it has four rail details that run from the top of the cabinet uh, curve around the edge and down the front. I began by working the epoxy sculpt into cracks and using it to recreate any missing areas. Here you can see I've roughly rebuilt the entire curve section of a rail. When everything hardened, I used a file to shape the new pieces and, you know, remove excess material. The work was slow going and I often had to mix fresh batches of epoxy sculpt to correct issues along the way. Epoxy sculpt was also used to fill and smooth the cracks where the cabinet was glued. In tight corners, I used an X-Acto to uh, gently scrape excess material away. As things started shaping up, I used sandpaper for the finishing touches. And overall, I was pleased with the results, so I moved on to the back of the cabinet. The holes for the back panel screws were almost all broken, so I worked on rebuilding them. I got good results by inserting machine screws into what was left of the holes and forming epoxy sculpt around them to create the new screw posts. Uh, once hardened, I simply unscrewed the screws from the new posts and shaped them with a file. The repair was a success and the new posts worked perfectly. The back panel of our radio wasn't in good shape even before the shipping disaster. The top left corner was missing, and its brown color didn't match the ivory cabinet. According to the ad, our radio was available in black, ivory, and brown, and somehow our ivory radio acquired the back panel from a brown radio over the years. Matching or not, I was happy to have the panel. A surprising number of antique radios are now missing back panels because they were often flimsily made. I had to paint the cabinet, so painting the back panel to match wasn't going to be a problem. First, though, I wanted to rebuild the missing corner. I began by working some epoxy sculpt into the rough shape, directly joining it with the panel. Again, the work was slow, difficult, and frustrating. After many hours of sculpting and filing, though, I was able to form a shape that mirrored the upper right corner well. Because it had taken so much work to get to this point, I figured that I would leave the inner corner as a right angle and not try to recreate the curve. My perfectionism got the better of me, though, and I eventually decided to take on the challenge. I filled in the rough shape and used a grommet to draw a guide for the curve. Using a curved file, I removed the excess material and was happy with the result. 
Feeling like a confident sculptor now, I decided I'd also try to recreate the raised details. Any confidence I had was quickly erased, though, because I simply didn't have the skills for that type of precision. First, I tried shaping the clay directly on the panel, and that didn't work. Then I tried rolling it into a long, thin worm and laying it on top. More sad results. It was really humbling, actually. Ancient Greeks sculpted this masterpiece 2,000 years ago, and I couldn't even make a worm. Well, I'm not good with clay, but I am good with wires. I found a piece roughly the same gauge as the rail and pulled the copper out. I then stretched and stapled it to a wood block and used a dremel to flatten one side. I laid down a bead of glue and placed the insulator flat side down. Using an alcohol swab, I pushed the wire into position and removed excess glue. I then cut a smaller piece of wire into shape and used it to fashion the upper rail. Next, I bent a plastic washer and glued it to the panel to form the screw hole detail. Satisfied with the results, I moved on to rebuild some other problem areas on the back. Once completed, I shipped the parts off to the painting department. Here's our cabinet, clean, sanded, and ready for the first coat of paint. What I jokingly call my painting department is just a spray booth that lets me paint and stain indoors. It keeps the paint from getting contaminated with dust and my lungs and house from getting contaminated with fumes. After some experimentation, I chose Rust-Oleum's American Accent Spray in Gloss Ivory. It has excellent coverage, there's no need for a separate primer, and the color was an almost perfect match to the ivory plaskin. After several coats, the results were impressive. The back panel surface was prepared with fine steel wool, and I painted its inside face first. The Rust-Oleum did a great job covering the dark brown. After a few coats, though, I realized there were too many imperfections, so I mixed up more epoxy sculpt and used it to fill and smooth the remaining cracks. After a bit of surface prep, I applied the final coats of paint and was happy with the results. At the same time, I fixed a minor issue with the cabinet and gave it a final coat as well. Radios have grill cloths to let the sound from the speaker out while providing protection and decoration. The grill cloth in our radio was too worn to be reused, unfortunately, and the backing panel was falling apart. To replace them, I first traced the shape of the old panel to a suitable piece of thin board and cut out a new one. Before applying the new cloth to the panel, I tested it in the cabinet to make sure everything fit. Spray adhesive was applied to the panel and I attached the new cloth, taking care to keep it aligned and centered. I then applied foam tape inside the cabinet and installed the new panel. Looking good! This concludes the first video in our series. On the next video, we'll delve into the chassis which houses the electronic parts. To stay updated, please subscribe and click the bell. See you soon!